In this video, we're going to look at what causes a Baker's cyst to form and how do you know that you've got it? What are the typical symptoms and how to best diagnose it? Then we're going to look at treatments and we're going to look at both conservative as well as surgical treatments and when you should consider which option. And lastly, we'll take a look at how long it can take to recover. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mareka. I'm one of the physiotherapists from sportsinjuryphysio.com where you can get online physiotherapy assessment as well as treatment for your injuries. Have a look at the description of this video if you want to link to our website. To understand why a Baker's is formed, it's useful to first look at the anatomy. So you've got several tendons that crosses your knee joint on all sides. And wherever you've got a tendon close to a bone or close to another tendon, you get little bursa, bursas. Now a bursa is a fluid filled sac that is meant to reduce friction between tendons or between a tendon and a bone. The bursa at the back of your knee is a special one because it's actually got a direct connection to your knee joint. And that connection acts like a one-way valve. So fluid from inside the knee joint can flow into the bursa. Now, whenever something is irritating the knee joint, like you've got an injury there, or there's something that causes more inflammation than fluid to be produced, this extra fluid also moves into the bursa and it causes it to extend or swell. And that then eventually forms what is known as a Baker's cyst. This is the reason why it's not that useful to just go and treat the Baker's cyst and remove it because it often just comes back. If you want to get rid of a Baker's cyst, you also have to address the cause for it. Some of the common causes for a Baker's cyst to develop is after a meniscus strain, especially if there's continuous irritation. Um, arthritis can cause it. Also an injury to the cartilage inside the joint or even a cruciate ligament tear. So there's several different reasons why you can get a Baker's cyst and it can be helpful to understand what is your cause so that you can address it through the correct treatment. So what does it feel like when you've got a Baker's cyst? Well, in most cases, you won't actually know you've got one. They are often an, called an accidental finding on an MRI scan or something. When they scan your knee for something else, they'll go, oh, you've got a Baker's cyst. Now, if it's not causing you any symptoms, you don't really have to do anything about it. Although I will say that it's usually a sign that your knee joint isn't 100% happy. So it may be useful to speak to a physio to understand what type of exercises and activity modification you can do to help your knee joint become a bit more happier. But what you will find if you've got a symptomatic Baker's cyst is you can experience a feeling of fullness behind the knee or an achiness behind the knee. It may sometimes be difficult to straighten your knee fully or bend it fully if it's quite a, a large one. Also, if you're standing upright and you straighten your knees out, you may see that it even looks swollen at the back of your knee. Then, if it's a very big one, it may press directly on the blood vessels that run in the back of the knee. And if that happens, you'll find that your calf swells. It can change color to either being red or blue. It can be quite achy in the calf and it may even feel hard to touch. Now, all of these are also signs of deep vein thrombosis. And if you experience any of it, you should really consult your doctor immediately. Or if you can't get a hold of your doctor, go to the emergency department because that usually needs to be dealt with immediately. Also, in even rarer cases, you may find that that um, cyst compresses a nerve. Now, if that happens, you'll find that you lose some strength in the muscles in your lower leg. You can lose a bit of sensation and you may even see that your calf becomes a bit smaller than normal. Again, if this, if you experience any of these symptoms, speak to your doctor immediately. Then lastly, in very rare cases, the Baker cyst may become so large that it actually bursts. And when this happens, it can be super painful and it can cause the fluid to leak into your calf muscles. Again, the calf will swell and be red and really, really painful. And it can be difficult to distinguish that from having a blood clot. So it's, again, important to speak to your doctor as soon as possible if this should happen. So how can you properly diagnose a Baker's cyst? Well, you usually have three options. The first is that people can use x-ray. Now, X-ray is not that useful because it only shows you bones. It doesn't show you any soft tissue, so you can't really say that it is a Baker's cyst or not. What it can show you, though, is if there's anything else going on in the joint, like arthritis can show up on an X-ray, 
or if there's loose bodies. A loose body is whenever a piece of bone or cartilage or something else breaks off and now it's floating inside the joint and irritating it. The second choice of scan is you could do an ultrasound scan and some people use that to diagnose it. It can be difficult though to distinguish on ultrasound scan between a uh, Baker's cyst and other causes like a tumour for instance or a cyst in the meniscus. So they are not that great. The gold standard at the moment is our MRI scans and this image shows you how it would show up on an MRI scan. So the other benefit of an MRI scan is also that you can see other causes like meniscus tears and things like that on it. So it's good for diagnosing the cause and not just the fact that it's a, a Baker's cyst. The treatment for Baker's cysts really should address the cause of um, the Baker's cyst as well. Otherwise, what the research is showing that even if you have surgery, sometimes the Baker's cyst just comes back because that irritation has not gone. Now, if your Baker's cyst is pressing directly on a nerve or on a blood vessel, your doctor will likely advise that you go for surgery first before trying anything else because those conditions can cause permanent damage. But in all other cases, there's a three-step process that's usually followed. Now, step one is that you try and use conservative treatment and conservative treatment consists of things like medication, load management, exercises. I'll discuss them all in more detail in a minute. The second step is if that doesn't work, then your doctor may suggest that you get an injection to just help calm things down so that conservative treatment can then work. And then lastly, if you've done everything right and it still doesn't want to respond, then surgery may be an option. So let's look at all three of these steps in more detail. So step one, conservative management, means anything where you don't actually inject or cut things in the knee. Now, as mentioned before, Meniscus tears is one of the most common reasons why people get Baker's cyst. And if you want to know about the specific treatment and exercises for meniscus tears, we've made a whole long video and exercise video about that as well. And I'll put links to those in the description of this video. So let's look at one of the first and easiest things that your doctor may prescribe, which is medication. Now, if your knee joint irritation is due to excessive inflammatory response, like with arthritis, then you may actually benefit from having anti-inflammatory medication, but it really needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. And your doctor may have very good reasons not to prescribe it to you, depending on what other medications you're using. So before you start taking things over the counter, do speak to your doctor about this, but it can make a difference. Icing your knee can be a really good option to help reduce the swelling, the inflammation, as well as some pain. But this does not mean that you just plonk the ice on the knee and leave it there for most of the day. Because actually, cooling things down too much can also cause trouble. So at the moment, the advice is that one leaves the ice pack on there for 10 minutes. Then you remove it for 10 minutes to allow your skin to, to warm up a little bit and prevent it from getting damaged. But then you can reapply it for 10 minutes for a better effect. You always want to put a wet towel between your skin and whatever source of cold you're using because that also stops the skin from being injured. Now, I've put a link in the description of this video to different types of ice packs that I found on Amazon that I feel is useful because they, they actually, you can attach them to your leg that you don't have to hold it in place the whole time. But to be honest, a frozen packet of peas works just as nice because it's contained in the bag. Just do not eat the peas afterwards because it will be sour. Load management is a very important topic that people often neglect. Now, what do I mean with load management? When something's irritated or injured in the body, it only has a certain strength and tolerance for doing jobs. Like for instance, if we think of the knee, whenever you stand on your, on your legs, you're carrying weight through the knee. Whenever you're walking, you're carrying weight through the knee. That um, weight and force that it has to deal with increases if you do things like going up a hill or getting up from a really low height. Now, when it's irritated, it will only have a certain tolerance for standing on your leg for so many minutes or walking such a distance. And where people often go wrong is that they try to force it to do more than what it currently can. Whereas actually, if you reduce your activity to the level that it can tolerate, it allows it to calm down. Often also, the reason why the knee has flared up and caused the Baker cyst 
it's because you've actually just overdone things. So if we think of arthritis, for instance, arthritis takes years and years to develop. So you would have had arthritis in your knee for a very long time before it's now flared up and caused a Baker cyst. What I normally see happens is somebody doesn't do much activity and they don't do too much. And then suddenly they want to revamp the house or do a lot of gardening after the winter season or increases their walking distance dramatically. Now, your knee's not had the tolerance to do all of that activity. So it just overloads and then it flares up. So actually to blame the arthritis for the Baker cyst in this instance is not 100% correct because that arthritis didn't cause you trouble while you weren't overdoing things. It's only when you suddenly ramped things up that it caused you trouble. If, however, you didn't go up that suddenly with your activity and instead you did little bits more week on week to allow it to grow stronger, you may never have had trouble. So load management is a really important part of rehab, but also preventing this coming back. Now, how do we do this? So the first step is to establish what activity your knee can currently tolerate without it feeling worse or swelling more. So when we think of activity, it's everything in the day that you do. So it's the amount you stand, the amount you walk, the number of stairs you climb, all of those things that you need to take note of. Now, I know it can be a little bit overwhelming, but a physio can help you sort this out and figure out what things are really your aggravating stuff. Because also, we don't want you to just sit down and rest the whole day. Because actually, complete rest can make a knee feel worse. And why is that? Because knees don't have arteries going into them. They require movement to get fluid in and out. Now, if you keep your leg dead still and you think, well, I'm just not going to do anything, then your knee will actually start to feel stiffer and more uncomfortable because all of that is just accumulating. Also, if you stay that still, actually you're losing more strength. So it's not useful for the rest of the body. So getting the load um, tolerance or the relative rest, we call it, um, pitched at the right level is really important. Because Baker's cysts can be caused through several different things and they can come in various um, levels of irritation or sensitivity, there's really no one size fits all type of exercise that works for people. So your exercise that you do has to be catering for what is your cause and how sore and irritated your knee is currently. But in most cases, people's knees can usually benefit from two types of exercise. One is exercises that increases the circulation and helps to get rid of that extra fluid and helps the joint to get fed. And the other type is strength training. So let me talk about each one um, and give you some examples. So let's have a look at what exercises you can do to help improve the circulation in your knee. Now remember, you don't have arteries going in and out of the joint. It requires movement to get old fluid out, new fluid containing all your nutrients and oxygen into it. So the exercises that you can do to help um, improve the circulation are things that re uses a repetitive flexion and extension motion, so lots of movement, but that are low load. So we don't want a lot of impact because the joint at the moment is a bit, of se bit sensitive in there. So what exercises qualify for this? Well, the first one that works really well if it suits your knee is getting on a stationary bike. Now, why a stationary, stationary bicycle? Because it allows you to really adjust things in the moment. If you're outside and the bike's not quite set up right, it um, can take quite a lot of effort to get the settings right. So a stationary bike is better. And also, if you've got to stop quickly and put your foot down, you may re-injure your knee. So it's better to start with a stationary bike. Now, the things you want to look at is, one, how high your saddle is. The lower the saddle, the more the strain on the knees. The higher the, sa the saddle, the slightly easier it is. Also, if your knee's really swollen, it may not want to bend too much, and having a slightly higher saddle can really help with that. Do you call it a saddle or a seat? Anyways, you know what I mean. Then also, the position you place your feet on. So if you're more on the ball of your foot, or the ball of your foot is quite far forwards on the pedal, then it puts a different type of force through the knee as when the ball of the foot is slightly back on the pedal. And the same thing goes for where your body is actually situated, situated with regards to forwards or backwards. 
Also, you're not looking to cycle up the Himalayas, so keep it easy. We're looking for lots of motion, but not high force at this point. As your knee recovers, you can of course increase the resistance, but the aim for this first period is purely to get the legs moving and it to feel comfortable. Now, it's always good to test a short session first because the knee may not let you know in the moment that you're doing too much. So even if it feels 100% fine, just do 10 minutes and see how it feels after 24 hours. If it feels fine, then you can repeat that. Now, if you're somebody who's quite used to exercise and quite fit, um, and you've exercised recently, you could do this every single day. If you're new to cycling and you've not really done much exercise, it may be better to do it every second day. Now, another brilliant option that's low load and can give you lots of movement in the knee is if you get into a swimming pool. Now, you don't have to swim in the swimming pool. You can even just walk up and down because the swimming pool, the water takes some of your weight away. Also, you can do deep water running where you've got a float on. So you'll see it's like a, a safety jacket nearly that you've got on. So you can be in the really deep water. Your, your feet aren't actually touching the bottom and you're just doing a circular motion with your feet. Now, if you don't have one of those jackets, you can also use a pool noodle just underneath your arms that you have it there that it allows you to, um, to not sink. Something else that could be useful is instead of doing your own thing, you could perhaps join a class or get some hydrotherapy lessons with somebody that they can teach you what's the best thing to do in the water and then you can go and do it on your own. Now, if you don't have access to a pool and you don't really have a, a bicycle, then other things you can do is just simple exercises at home. So things like being on the floor or on the bed is usually better because you don't have to struggle to get down to the floor and just bending and extending your knee. And if it hurts to do that, help it with your hands. It's the movement we're looking for. It doesn't have to be done uh, through your own power at the, at the beginning. And I'll show you how to do that in this clip. Do this exercise on a bed because if you're gonna try it on the floor, if your knee's really painful, it's gonna be painful to get down onto the floor and back up again. And so it's definitely better to do it on a bed. I just didn't have a bed that I could use at the moment. So what you want to do is imagine for a moment, this is my injured leg and this is my uninjured leg. You want to try and sit with your back against a wall so that you support yourself, um, that you don't have to struggle to stay upright. And then I like getting the person to bend the uninjured knee because it just gives you a little bit of help with the movement. And then what you do is you just slowly bend your knee to where it wants to go and then let it go back down again. And you'll notice I'm placing my hands there to just help it because often if your knee is very swollen and painful, it actually doesn't want to move because the muscles have just gone to sleep and everything's really stiff. So it can really help if you just gently, you try to move it with your own muscles, but you also help it. And you just repeat that movement to where you feel is comfortable for you. And you'll find after a few repetitions, you actually get more range of motion going. Another low load option that you can do at home is if your knee will extend while you're sitting in the chair, you can just sit and straighten your leg out, hold it for a few seconds and bend it again. Now you can do this in two ways. You can either hold it there to get some muscle strength as well, or you can just continuously bend and straighten it. And I'll show you how to do it in this clip. We're gonna not lift the whole leg up as we try to lift. If you flex the foot, it helps to activate it. And also it doesn't matter if your leg can't go fully straight. You just work it to where it can. Now, sometimes you can feel a tight pulling all along your leg. That just means other things are a bit tight and stopping you from, from getting the full range. So if you lean slightly back and just sit leaning backwards in the chair, you can usually get it straight without that pulling sensation. So the aim of this exercise is to strengthen the quad muscles and get them to work through the full range. So it doesn't matter if you lean back to take the, straight, the, the stretch off, because you can then better activate this. So it's not cheating, it's useful, especially if you have um, that tightness. And often if you've had a back injury in the past, that's when you'll feel it. So what do we do? You're sitting on a sturdy chair, dining room chair works really well, hold on. And you're thinking about flexing your foot, tightening up your muscle, and just slowly trying to get it as straight as you can. And you hold it there for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 
and slowly back down. So what I don't want to see is it goes boom, okay? You have to control it down because then you get double benefit in any case. But again, remember, if you try this and you think, oh man, that's really tight at the back. It's actually painful nearly as tight. Lean backwards so that you take the strain off basically your sciatic nerve and your hamstrings and it will allow you to get that full range. Then we get to strength training exercises. Now, why on earth would strengthening your muscles help your uh, bake assist? Well, when we walk or stand or run or even climb stairs, our muscles are meant to absorb most of the force. And they're also meant to stabilize your knee joint. So the stronger your muscles are, the less force goes through the knee and the better it's stabilized and the less irritation. And for knee pain specifically, there's strong ev evidence that strengthening the quadricep muscles, which is the, the front thigh muscles, can help reduce knee pain and help improve function. Um, for Baker's cyst, I will also say it's good to include exercise for the hamstrings because the Baker's cyst sits so close to the hamstring tendons, it can often just make them not want to work that well. So it can be useful to include exercises for that. So when we look at some examples for strength training exercises, I'm going to look at ones you can do at home versus ones you can do in the gym and what the benefits are of those. Remember, if you're looking for exercises specifically for meniscus tears, I've made a whole video of that and you can find it in the description of this video. Okay, so simplest option for strength training at home for the for the quads is a high wall sit. Now, a high wall sit, why not a normal wall sit? Well, you notice the person in this picture has got her legs at a 90 degree angle. That's actually really hard work for an injured knee and most people won't tolerate it. Whereas if you do a high wall sit where you just go down a little bit, the knee usually tolerates that better. I demonstrate that and explain all of this in the next clip. The first thing to think about is how do we place our legs? You want them to be aligned with your hips. So hip distance apart, not wider, not together, just kind of in line with that. Feet do not have to point straight forward, but if that's comfortable, you do that. Um, it's okay if they turn out a tiny bit to the sides. The key here is if you go down and you sit on the wall, the knee has to be in line with the middle of the foot. So I'm going to keep mine straight for now. The second thing to think to consider is how far away from the wall you place your feet. So what I mean with that is if I'm going to place my feet close to the wall, can you see that when I go down, I get quite a lot of flexion in there. And actually with your knee traveling over the front of your toes, it places the, um, it moves the, the, the area where you carry the weight more to the front of the knee. If you bring your feet slightly forwards and now you go down, can you see that I don't have that much of a knee bend there? And you'll feel that you're putting the pressure through a different part of your knee. So that's something you can play with. Usually I find my patients are most comfortable if they place your, their feet um, a little bit further away from the wall. And then you do not have to go down low. I would suggest you only start with about a 45 degree angle and see if you can hold that. If that feels uncomfortable, take yourself up a bit higher. If that's all you can hold, that's absolutely fine. That's where you start. So you want to then hold it for 10 seconds, come out and relax for 10 seconds and do about 10 repetitions. If you feel you get used to that and that's easy, you can increase how long you hold it for, but you can also slowly, slowly increase how far you go down and where you hold it. So my wall's not very slippery. It works really well if you use the back of a door that's nice and slippery. But whatever you lean against, make sure it can't open on you or, or fall over. So that's where you want to hold it. So let me show you from this angle. My knees are in line with the middle of my feet and I'm just holding the position. So you progress it through either holding for longer or you start going lower down. There's no need to go and do it there because that's really hard work for my knees. It's fine to do it in the mid range, okay. Another really useful exercise that I really like is a high box squat. Now, I prefer the box squat actually to the wall sit because you get a lot of movement as well, so you feed the joint a bit. It's a high box sit, 
because otherwise the knee may not like going down all the way to the to the level of a chair so you have to find what's useful for your knee and i explain that in more detail in this clip i find a high box squat is quite a comfortable one to start with usually again because it it having a box or a chair behind you forces you to push your bum out to the back a bit more and you get your glutes engaged more and it just feels a bit safer. The other nice thing about it is you can set the height. So you can put loads of cushions on a chair or use a high box to limit the range of motion to the comfortable bit. If you start without it, then it's quite easy to go to low and annoy your knee. So it's just a nice stable way. Whatever you use, make sure that the chair can't move away from you so it's against the wall. Also, preferably one with sides to it so that you can't miss it when you sit down. So you've got to make sure that you do not miss um, the object that you're going to sit down on. How do you do it? You're standing with your feet hip distance apart again. I'll show you from the front in a minute. And then as you go down, your knees stay aligned with the middle of your foot. Doesn't matter if your feet point out slightly, they just need to go in, in line with the middle of your foot. And you're going to have your hands in front of you, stick your bottom out to the back, sit down and have your hands out the front to help stabilize and slowly come back up again. And that's the level of control I want to see when a person does it. So you're sticking your bottom out, making sure your knees don't turn in as you're going down. They've got to stay out aligned with your feet and you touch your bum down and come back up. That's what you do. So to show you from the front, my knees are staying in line with my feet and I'm just doing that motion. As you get stronger, as you get used to the exercise, you take a cushion away until you can comfortably do it to the level of a normal dining room chair. That's all what we're looking for at this point. For the hamstrings, one of the easiest things to do is a isometric bridge where you lie on your back and you lift your bottom up. You do not have to lift it all the way up. That is really high and you just hold the position. So things you want to look out for here is that you don't, um, that you have your feet bent in a comfortable position. Also, you don't want to arch your back up too high and you just lift your bum to where it's comfortable. Even if you don't lift all the way up, that will still make your hamstrings work and your, um, your glutes contract. So you're squeezing your bottom and your tummy muscles to get you up there, not using the back. If you feel it in your back, come down a tiny bit and squeeze your bum more. If your neck's not happy, you may have to find a different type of exercise, but try to relax your, your neck and don't be too much on the neck. It's really just the upper back a little bit there and come back down. Quite often, people will try doing the exercises at home and they just cannot do it because it's too uncomfortable and too painful. And you'll be surprised that actually going to the gym can make a big difference. Why is that? Well, you've got so many options with the machines that you can set it up and you can set the resistance just right that it suits your leg. Also, you can usually adjust the position your legs are in that it's just at the angle that you're really comfortable. So if you're not getting on with the exercise at home, do consider going to the gym. Now, some of the examples of exercise that could be useful at the gym is the leg press machine, for instance. Now, you, you get two main types of leg press. One where you press more straight out from your body, like the picture at the top, and then you also get a, a leg press where you press more up towards the ceiling, like the, uh, the picture at the bottom. Now, often for knee pain, the one where you press straight out is more comfortable. There are several ways in which you can adapt the leg press machine as well. You can look at um, the distance your feet are apart. Usually it's best if you have them hip distance apart. Then depending on whether you move them up on the plate or down on the plate, your knee will take the pressure through a different part and you need to find the position that's comfortable for you that way. Then also, depending on how far you bend it back, it can be comfortable or not. And usually it's best to limit it that you don't bend your legs all the way back. You just keep it to about a 90 degree angle at the start and you make it super light. So play with all those elements. I've also summarized them in a blog post before and I'll put a link to that blog post in this um, video as well. But the leg press is a brilliant machine to strengthen your quads, your hamstrings, as well as your glutes. Then you get the knee extension machine where you lift your legs straight and straighten them out with weight. 
a useful one to strengthen the front thigh muscles. What I will say with that is it may not be comfortable to straighten your legs all the way up. That's absolutely fine. Do it to where you can and start with light weights and slow the movement down and build the weight as you get stronger. If you can eventually get to doing it with one leg at a time, that's even better because then you can make sure that you're not um, that you don't not overworking with a with an uninjured leg. Then for the hamstrings, just the opposite. Instead of lifting the weight up, you want to curl the legs by pushing the weight down. And again, if it's uncomfortable to have them fully straight, just straighten them to where it's comfortable and bend them to where it's comfortable. And the instructors in the gym will be able to show you how to adjust those machines for that. Now the low load exercises that we do for circulation can usually be done on a daily basis, but ask your physio, they'll be able to advise you on that. The higher load, the strength training exercises should usually only be done twice to three times a week. And that's because you need a recovery period after each, each session for the body to properly recover. If you do them too often, they can actually cause irritation as well. So it's useful to speak to a physio to understand when in the week is the best time to do your low load exercises, your high load exercises, and how many times you can do that. Um, but observe how your knee reacts to it as well. And especially the 24 hour response is important because sometimes an activity can feel fine while you're doing it, but then your leg or your knee can swell significantly later on. If that happens, it's a sign that this exercise is likely not right for you. When we talk about injections for Baker's cyst, it's, we're talking about corticosteroid injections. Now, if you've tried conservative treatment of load management and exercise and perhaps medication for about four to six weeks and you've not seen any results or your knee is super painful and swollen and you just can't get going with things. Your doctor may suggest that a corticosteroid injection is the way to go. Now, I know people have learned to distrust injections because they're not that great for tendon injuries or muscle injuries. But actually, when it comes to a Baker's cyst, the research shows that they can be very useful. And the injection can either be done straight into the knee joint or it can be done under ultrasound guidance into the Baker's cyst itself. The important thing to understand is that it's not an immediate relief that you'll get. It takes about four to six weeks for that injection to fully work because it works through calming down the inflammatory reaction and that takes time. Also, often the day after the injection can be so painful and that's really common for um, corticosteroid injections. Do not let that put you off. Just ask your doctor, what can you do if it's really, really painful is there anything you can take? Is there anything you should do? Should you put ice on? What do they suggest? But it's usually just for a day or two and then the pain starts to subside and you start to see improvements. Also, remember, when your knee now starts to feel better, don't just ramp your training up quickly because you would have had a few weeks where you've not done much and your knee won't be strong to just suddenly start doing loads of stairs or lots of walking. You have to slowly, slowly increase its tolerance to that. Otherwise, the knee will just flare up again. You may also still benefit from doing regular exercise to improve the circulation, like we spoke about before, as well as strength training. Because remember, you want to address the cause of this all. And if you get that knee stronger, you can prevent it from coming back in the future. Before I get on to surgery, I would like to answer one of the questions that a community member asked me on YouTube. Now, this person injured their knee five years ago, had a meniscus tear, and the doctor just said, ah, it'll be fine. You don't have to do anything. Physio wasn't even advised. But the knee never really repaired itself and it never got that much better. But then, unfortunately, um, COVID hit. He couldn't see a doctor, so no follow-up was, hap was happening. And now at this point, they're at the point where the knee is super painful. They can't walk much. Um, they don't know what to do with it. Also, because it's so painful, they've gained a bit of weight because they can't be active. So that's making it worse. And they've also got a back injury with a nerve that's pinching. So they are limited to how much time they can spend on their feet and how much exercise they can do. So this is now quite a vicious cycle and they're feeling quite down with it. Now, physiotherapy has now started and they've been suggested to do some gentle exercises. By the way, the things you've been given sounds perfect for the condition your knee is in. 
it's mainly um, sliding the foot back and forward, forward, so that will help with circulation. And it is also doing the sit to stand, which helps to strengthen the legs gently. But they're quite desperate and wanted to know what else can be suggested here. So I would say this case sounds a bit tricky because your back is also influencing how much you can do. So I would suggest that you consider, are you able to sit on a stationary bike? If the answer is yes, then that may be an option. Or otherwise, look into possibly getting in a hydrotherapy pool with somebody who's skilled, who can help you figure out exercises that can help both your lower back as well as your knees. Or even just walking in the pool may already be an option because there's less weight going through. And if you use one of those pool noodle things, you can often lean forwards that your back feels more comfortable or find a position that's more comfortable. Now, also, if your knee does not react to the treatment and it remains that painful, you may be a candidate for an injection to see if that helps to calm things down quicker. But then from your message, I wasn't able to tell that clearly, but it sounded as if actually your lower back may be the thing that's limiting your mobility more than anything else. So my question would be, would it be more helpful to actually seek help from a physio for your lower back and seeing if you can improve the situation with the nerve being pinched because that will allow you to be mo more mobile in general. Then the other thing that you mentioned was that you have gained a bit of weight. Now, I know it can be so difficult to lose weight when you can't move and do exercise, but if you're able to lose even just a couple of pounds or kilos, it can make a big difference to how happy your knees feel because it's so much less weight that goes through them. So see if you can get some advice on diet, perhaps, or make small changes that can help to reduce your weight, if it's possible at all. So should you have surgery for a Baker cyst or not? Well, the research shows that it can be very effective, but actually even with surgery, you need to also address the cause because if they just go in and remove the Baker cyst, that often just makes it come back. They have to also do something about what's causing it, like fix the meniscus tear or shave the cartilage if it's very frayed and there's a lot of arthritis in there. Um, and in severe cases, they may, the doctor may even suggest that, you know what, actually you just need a knee replacement because this is just going to carry on. So surgery has to be also catered to the individual. Now, there are rare cases that you will have surgery as the first choice of treatment. And that's whenever something is pressing on a nerve or pressing on a blood vessel. The doctor may feel that actually you need surgery to take that pressure off immediately. Some instances they may suggest an injection first, but it will all depend on how severely that pressure is affecting your nerve or your, your blood vessel. So how long can you expect recovery to take? Well, to be honest, there's such a wide variety of reasons why a knee can become irritated that there's no one recovery period that I can name. However, what I will say is usually a Baker cyst react, uh, is formed in reaction to an ongoing irritation. And in my experience, it takes about three months to see really good results. If you're on the right route with the treatment, you should start seeing results from about four to six weeks but you'll only see very significant results from 12 weeks onwards. Also, if you get a corticosteroid injection, they take about four to six weeks to really work. So that's the period of time you can, you can expect it to take before those kick in. Brilliant. Hope you found this useful. And remember, if you need more help with an injury, you're welcome to consult one of the team via video call. The link to the website is in the description of this video. Take care.